When you talk about the most beloved pro wrestlers in history, it's the ones who made a connection with the audience beyond their on-screen character. In that sense, you look at people like Daniel Bryan, Eddie Guerrero, and maybe, most of all, Mick Foley. Generally accepted to be one of the most beloved people in the entire industry, it's hard not to love Mrs. Foley's baby boy. However, Foley's popularity also comes from his ability to entertain fans in a variety of ways. From his early days portraying the dastardly heel Cactus Jack character in WCW, to his excellent promo work in ECW before finally making it to the WWF where he would manage to get three completely different gimmicks over simultaneously. So, join us today as we take a deep dive into his fascinating entire career journey in Have a Nice Day, The Mick Foley Story. Michael Francis Foley was born in Bloomington, Indiana on June 7, 1965, though he wouldn't remain there for long as, shortly after his birth, his family moved over to Long Island, New York, where they would settle for the rest of his childhood. Here, Mick spent his youth getting involved in both lacrosse and amateur wrestling, the latter of which he did alongside the future King of Queens, Kevin James, who was a schoolmate of his at the time. Mick also found an early love for pro wrestling though, and as the famous story goes, while at college, he hitchhiked to Madison Square Garden to watch Jimmy Superfly Snooka leap from the top of a steel cage during a match against Don Morocco. This event was what allegedly inspired Foley to begin training with Dominic DiNucci in Pennsylvania, traveling between there and his college campus whenever he had the free time. By 1983, he was ready to hit the ring and started appearing on local cards being promoted by DiNucci. Through this, he also got the opportunity to make a few appearances with WWE as an enhancement talent, and it was during one of these matches that the Dynamite Kid infamously broke his jaw, leaving him unable to eat solid food for weeks afterwards. Still, this didn't deter the youngster. He kept on building a name for himself by working on the indie circuit, appearing for both the Universal Wrestling Federation and the Continental Wrestling Association over the next five years as he developed his in-ring persona of Cactus Jack. Cactus Jack was presented as a lunatic wild man, willing to put his body on the line at any opportunity by performing sickeningly dangerous feats. This character took him to World Class Championship Wrestling on November 20th, 1988, where he would lengthen it to Cactus Jack Manson, playing on his psychotic moveset and physical similarity to Charles Manson. And it was in WCCW that Jack found his first real success, as he would go on to win both their light heavyweight and tag team titles on more than one occasion. This was enough to get him noticed by World Championship Wrestling, who he would sign with in September 1991, with Cactus immediately positioned in a prominent main event heel position after attacking Sting. Here he was presented as an even more maniacal figure, often shrieking like a pig during matches and yelling out his signature bang bang catchphrase before laying out opponents. This, along with his continually reckless in-ring style, which seemed to show little regard for his own health, caught on with fans to the point that by early 1993, he turned babyface for the first time, putting himself square in the crosshairs of Big Van Vader. This feud is one that's still talked about to this day due to the sheer level of punishment both men inflicted on each other during it. As we've already mentioned, Foley seemed to have little regard for his own body when in the ring, and Vader was notorious for being one of the stiffest performers in the industry at that time, so combined together, they created a series of matches that are still difficult to watch even today. Some of the most extreme moments of their series included Mick being powerbombed onto concrete, leaving him concussed and temporarily losing all sensation in his left foot, the entirety of their Texas Death Match at October 1993's Halloween Havoc, and most infamously, Cactus having his right ear torn off during a house show match in Germany. It got so brutal at one point that WCW even allegedly refused to book them in matches together. Despite this, however, Mrs. Foley's baby boy was growing increasingly frustrated with how his character was being treated creatively within the company. He felt that something as major as him losing an ear should have been used to create a big-time storyline, but Eric Bischoff felt otherwise, seeing Foley as something of a liability by that point. It was this, along with other similar standoffs between the two, which led to the hardcore legend neglecting to sign a new contract in 1994, with him instead choosing to go back to the independent scene, working for the likes of Smoky Mountain Wrestling and Extreme Championship Wrestling throughout the next three years. It was a risky move for sure. Mick and his wife Colette had just had their second child, Noelle, the year prior, and so leaving behind a large contract may have seemed crazy to others. 
He believed in his own ability to be more than what he was pegged for, however, and he certainly proved this in ECW, where he became one of the Renegade promotion's first major stars, playing an anti-hardcore character who lambasted the fans for demanding he put his body on the line for them, drawing massive heat in the process by refusing to fight dirty. This change was brought on after Foley saw a fan at an ECW show holding up a sign that read Kane Dewey, a reference to their desire to see his oldest child being beaten with a Singapore cane. This offended the notorious family man personally, and he was able to channel this into his new gimmick. Of course, while he was playing the anti-hardcore character in North America to great success, he was also being booked in Japan at the same time, where he was continuing to develop an aura around himself as a hardcore legend. He worked several dates for IWA Japan in 1995, where he would feud with the likes of Soji Nakamaki and Terry Funk. This was where Cactus went from that guy American fans knew about for taking crazy bumps in WCW to an almost mythological figure. The stories of his brutal death matches over in the East became something of a legend amongst the wrestling community, with some even doubting they'd happened at all. Of course, every so often someone would manage to get their hands on a tape of one of these shows and find themselves witness to a level of brutality that was unheard of in the West. Barbed wire ropes, thumbtacks, explosive devices, flaming weapons, seemingly nothing was off limits in Japan, and this was all captured perfectly during the IWA King of the Deathmatch tournament held on August 20th, 1995, where after surviving some of the bloodiest and most violent matches imaginable, Cactus was able to best Terry Funk in the final a barbed wire rope, exploding barbed wire boards, exploding ring, time bomb deathmatch to become the titular king of the deathmatch. After the tournament, Mick found himself badly cut up and suffering from second degree burns, and to make matters worse, he was only paid $300 for his troubles. Still, the tapes from that show would soon make their way around the world and create a renewed interest in Cactus Jack as a performer unlike any other. By 1996, WWE came calling again, Though this time, they didn't want him as an enhancement talent, they wanted him as a major player. Before that, however, he had to make his final appearance with ECW on March 9th of the same year, losing to Mikey Whipwreck as fans chanted, please don't go at him. Following the match, Foley then danced his way out of the arena to the tune of New York, New York, something he's later gone on to say was his favorite moment in wrestling. But that was now in his rearview mirror, and WWE was where his future lay. He made his debut on April 1st, 1996, the night after WrestleMania 12, to attack The Undertaker. Now he had a new gimmick, Mankind, a Hannibal Lecter-inspired psychopath which wore a mask and choked his opponents out with the mandible claw. Originally, Vince McMahon had planned to call the character Mason the Mutilator, however, Foley was able to avoid this when he suggested the name Mankind instead, arguing that it could have a double meaning when used in promos. Mankind would quickly become a success in WWE, being one of the few people during this period to get a victory over the dead man after Paul Bearer turned on Taker to join Foley's side and help him pick up the win during their Boiler Room Brawl match. Riding this big win, Mankind then forced WWE Champion Shawn Michaels to show a newer, more aggressive side to himself during their match at In Your House 10 Mind Games in September 1996. His battles with The Undertaker were far from over though, and a month later this feud would take the next step when they took part in the first ever Buried Alive match, with Mankind successfully managing to bury his opponent under six feet of dirt by the end. Wrestling. It's weird sometimes. Even weirder was that, despite having been buried alive, the dead man was able to return to action in November, faced off against Foley again at the Survivor Series, and continuing the feud all the way up until April of 1997, when the two battled over the WWE title. Though he was not able to win the title that night, Mankind would soon find solace in a babyface turn, as a series of sit-down interviews between him and Jim Ross were aired over the next few weeks, showing the more human side of Mick, breaking away from the artifice of Mankind and presenting him as a kid who grew up with a passion for wrestling and then followed his dream. During these interviews, footage was also shown of Dude Love, a hippie-inspired character that Foley had created for himself as a child, and it was after seeing the reaction this footage got, Vince McMahon proposed that Mick drop the Mankind character altogether and become Dude Love on TV instead. Around this time, Steve Austin and Shawn Michaels had become WWE Tag Team Champions, but after Michaels was taken out with an injury, the Rattlesnake found himself in need of a replacement partner. 
For weeks, Mankind had petitioned to be Austin's new teammate, but was repeatedly turned down. When he made his debut appearance as the Dudester on the July 14, 1997 episode of Raw, however, helping Austin get the victory, he was finally accepted as his full-time partner. At the same time, Foley was also involved in a heated feud with Triple H. However, in something that was pretty unique for fans at the time, he didn't just face him as Dude Love. No, he would instead appear as both Dude and Mankind at various points throughout the program, often throwing any game plan the game had up in the air as he didn't know which persona he would be facing that night. The highlight of this whole program came on the September 22, 1997 edition of Raw, where in front of a packed Madison Square Garden crowd, both alter egos of Mick appeared on the Titantron prior to his street fight with Triple H, each of them debating who would be the one to face him. By the end, they agreed that this kind of contest wasn't their forte and that there was another, a third personality, both a myth and a boogeyman to American fans, who was best suited to go to war that night. Yes, this was the night that Cactus Jack made his debut in WWE, absolutely obliterating Triple H with everything in sight before getting the win by pile-driving him through a table at the top of the entrance ramp. From then on, it would be the three faces of Foley who would come to strike terror in the hearts of heels everywhere in the company, with Mick regularly metamorphosizing between each one depending on what the situation called for. In fact, at the 1998 Royal Rumble, he even appeared as all three over the course of the titular match. It was also during this time that he reunited with Terry Funk to team up against the New Age Outlaws, a feud most memorable for Foley and Funk being violently thrown off the entrance ramp while inside a dumpster. Following that, Mick was once again seduced to the dark side as, under the guise of dude love, he became the first of Vince McMahon's many hired guns designed to get the WWE title off of Steve Austin. He would be unsuccessful in these attempts, however, and this led to Vince firing the Dudester. Luckily though, Mankind wasn't fired, and this left him free to return to TV as he reignited his feud with The Undertaker, with the two now taking things to levels of violence unheard of even in Japan. Yes, it was at the June 28, 1998 King of the Ring in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania where Mankind and The Undertaker squared off one more time inside Hell in a Cell. And what happened that night would go on to become both the defining moment of Foley's career and the peak of brutality at a wrestling show. Things started with Mick coming out to the ring and then immediately climbing up to the top of the cell, challenging his opponent to meet him up there. Soon after that, the dead man arrived too, and before long, they were brawling up on high. They precariously worked their way over to the edge of the cell, and then in one of the most shocking things ever seen on TV, Taker threw Mankind off the top sending him crashing 16 feet below through a wooden announcer's table. Mick had just taken the most horrifying bump imaginable, and from there, the match ground to a halt while doctors ran to the ringside area to check on his health. Thankfully, he was starting to stir by that point and officials quickly began wheeling him out of the arena on a gurney. Inexplicably, however, before they could get him backstage, Mick fully came to and insisted that he continue. After he pulled himself to his feet and climbed the cage once more to meet a shocked Undertaker for yet another brawl, all as the crowd below cheered in disbelief over what they were witnessing. While on top of the cage for the second time that night, Foley was chokeslammed, but instead of landing safely on the mesh wire roofing, he instead crashed through it down to the ring 13 feet below, knocking himself out legitimately when the back of his head collided with the ring. That was when the match started. 17 minutes later and it was mercifully over. Foley may have lost the bout, but he had won the respect of fans everywhere because of his performance that night, even getting a standing ovation as he was somehow able to walk out of the arena on his own two feet. During the course of the match, Mick suffered a severe concussion, a dislocated jaw, several bruised ribs, a dislocated shoulder, internal bleeding, puncture wounds in his back and his arms, and most gruesomely, a tooth that was driven through the roof of his mouth into his nose. Still, despite the after-effects, this was undoubtedly the moment that defined Foley's career, turning him into an icon forever. Following Hell in a Cell, he would take it relatively easy for the rest of the year, however, with the Mankind character now taking on a more comedic tone as he introduced the world to Mr. Sacco, a sock puppet who Foley would place on his hand before delivering the mandible claw to his opponents. By 1999, all of his sacrifices would be rewarded when he became WWE Champion on the January 4th episode of Raw, beating The Rock to probably the loudest crowd reaction ever heard at a wrestling show. It was a feel-good moment that could rival Rocky, 
and after the match, Mick even took the opportunity to dedicate the win to his kids watching at home. By now, of course, fans weren't cheering for mankind. They didn't come to see Dude Love, and they didn't hold up signs for Cactus Jack. No, they were there for Mick Foley, the man behind the mask who had found a place in their hearts that was untouched by the likes of even Steve Austin. Still, despite the levels of abuse his body had suffered the year prior, Mick did have one more incredibly violent bout left in him. At the 1999 Royal Rumble, he took on The Rock in an I Quit match which saw him losing after taking 11 vicious, unprotected chair shots to the head. The match, and the fallout with the hardcore legend's family afterwards, was captured in the documentary Beyond the Mat and caused him to have a wake-up call when it came to not only the physical punishment he was inflicting on his body, but the emotional punishment he was inflicting upon his family as they watched him do it. After that, he toned down his act again, forming a comedic odd couple tag team with the great one named The Rock and Sock Connection. He also published his critically acclaimed autobiography, Have a Nice Day, and slowly started to wind down his in-ring career over the course of 1999. By the end of that year, he was ready to retire from in-ring competition altogether, something that was hastened after he began complaining of recurring memory problems. Before he left, though, he would have one last feud with Triple H, facing him in back-to-back -back classics at both the 2000 Royal Rumble and No Way Out pay-per-views, in Street Fight and Hell in a Cell matches respectively. The Royal Rumble Street Fight was arguably the greatest match of the entire Attitude Era, and perhaps realizing that it was best to go out with a bang, the Hell in a Cell rematch in February was originally supposed to be Foley's final bout. Despite this, he would be tempted back one last time when he was offered a spot in the WrestleMania main event a month later something which had eluded him for his whole career. After that was over, however, he really was done for the time being, and during the next year, he transitioned into an on-screen role as WWE's commissioner, often acting as a babyface foil to the likes of The Game and Kurt Angle. By this point, Mick's injuries had long since caught up to him, and the repeated concussions had left him feeling like he was, in his own words, walking underwater at all times. He could also barely walk at points and was allegedly unable to bend over to put his own socks on, so it seemed like a good idea for him to ride off into the sunset and become a full-time author from then on, making the occasional Legends appearance if necessary. Except he couldn't do that. Many wrestlers have agreed that once you catch the bug, it's almost impossible to get rid of it. And Foley continued to return to wrestling sporadically over the next few years, each time having differing degrees of success. He had a fantastic hardcore match with Randy Orton at April 18th, 2004's Backlash, and another excellent one with Edge at WrestleMania 22, where he was memorably speared through a flaming table, but more often than not, these in-ring returns were underwhelming, as it was clear he was too beaten up to do many of the things he used to be able to do. However, Foley would continue to wrestle as he joined the TNA roster in 2008. This run was highlighted by Foley winning the promotion's world title at Lockdown 2009, Though, after a number of forgettable feuds over the next couple of years, he would wrestle his last match with the company, with he also by that point passed his prime Ric Flair. After that, he returned to WWE as an occasional on-screen presence and company ambassador. He did make a brief cameo in the 2012 Royal Rumble, which would turn out to be his last time competing inside a WWE ring. However, technically, Mick's final ever match came underwhelmingly in Matt and Jeff Hardy's indie promotion Omega, where on February 28, 2015, at their Night of a Champion show, Foley would defeat independent wrestler Mikey Gambino. Foley would return to WWE in 2016, where he became the on-screen Raw general manager and proved that he could still be a valuable asset to the company. Today, though, he spends the majority of his time away from wrestling, continuing to document his life stories in his series of biographies, as well as writing children's books. He can also now spend more time with his family. Mick and his wife are still together after all of these years, and their four children have all now gone on to have their own success, most notably their oldest son Dewey, who now works as a member of the WWE creative team. If there's anyone who deserves a happy retirement, it's Mick Foley. It's rare for anyone to make a personal connection with fans the way he did, and few wrestlers have left behind a legacy as big as his. So, until next time, we'll leave you with the words of the man himself. Have a nice day! Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow Wrestle with Andy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time!